Hello my lovelies. My name is Gilbert Dolphalian and the plan for today is to review both the pattern for my trunk hose and my own making process. If you haven't seen the videos already, the playlist is linked for you up here. I do recommend having a nosy at that first because that's got all the details about the process in it, including the mock-up, the structure and the construction. It was a long process, okay? And just to remind everyone, the pattern that I was using comes from the Tudor Tailor. And now that you're all caught up, let's get to the review. Let's talk about the pattern first. I enlarged the pattern from the book, but you can buy the pattern separately as well if you don't want to enlarge them yourself. These are also sized, so you would be able to cut out the right size for you, but I believe the instructions are the same as what's in the book. I'm not going to talk too much about historical accuracy because I just don't have the experience to do so, but I will say that I didn't find anything to contradict them in the research that I did, and that I'm very happy with the final shape of them. It matches up pretty nicely to extant garments and old paintings, which is a good indication that the pattern is a really good one. The book overall is a really good starting place for someone who's just trying to start a journey into Tudor clothing. It doesn't just have the patterns, but the first half is a one-stop shop if you're just looking to do a one-off costume. It has a wealth of information in there, including what I thought was the most useful part, detailing fabrics available at the time, and what kind of materials available today are a good match for them. It also has details on stitches and other techniques, just in case there's one or two in there that you didn't already know. I'd highly recommend getting it rather than or alongside the pattern if you can for those two parts alone. I do wish that it was colour pages the whole way through. Some of the black and white photos are really hard to make out the details from, but I think that's partially bad luck that they're not coloured where I'd like them to be, and that in places they're also quite small because they need to be fitted on the page with the patterns. Obviously they've made a choice to reduce costs and you can't really blame them for that. The pattern itself is not really one for beginners, but I'd really like to see the trunk hose pattern that is. Just by the nature of the complexity of the garment, the patterns themselves are also complex. I'm a visual learner, so once I had the pattern pieces cut out and in my hands, it made a lot more sense than it did having the instructions written down on paper. It is pretty well written, but there are a couple of things that I questioned at the time. One step that I found illogical was sewing the lining pieces together before darting them, but I do think in retrospect that if you're sewing by machine, sewing the lining seam with a dart butted right up against it, especially one that thick, would be a huge pain. And since the pattern is mostly intended for people to sew by machine, or mostly expecting that people are going to be sewing mostly by machine, this does actually make sense. However, it does also ask you to sew in the waistband before you do the crotch seam. I solved this by skipping ahead and doing the crotch and the outside seams and then doing the waistband, but the other option would be to sew the waistband on in two pieces, and then sew the back of the waistband when you do the crotch seam. There are several places where they name techniques and then don't describe those techniques, so if you're not buying the book which has those techniques listed earlier and just using the pattern, you will need to know, for example, cartridge pleats, eyelets, and pad stitching, so that is something that you need to be aware of. The only other thing that I would complain about is that I'm still not sure where they wanted me to put the wadding sausage in. It says at the top of the darts, but the picture actually shows it going in at the bottom of the darts where that big thick seam is. In my video I put them where it shows on the picture, but I did actually later move it to put them at the top of the darts at the narrowest point, and to my eye they look better there, they give a better weight, put the weight in a better position. Overall, someone with sewing experience shouldn't have too much difficulty with this pattern once they've gotten their head around all the pattern pieces and techniques that modern sewing doesn't particularly call for. 
But if you're only just started on your sewing journey, I'd suggest starting off with the Venetian hose, which are also included in the book. No pattern will be perfect because every sewer is coming from a different level of understanding. But in my opinion, this one does a really good job of balancing all the unfamiliar techniques to modern sewers and keeping it clear and succinct. Having so many pictures definitely helps, even if they are in black and white. So I am really glad that they're there. I would absolutely recommend this pattern, but as I've said with the book to help support the process, I'd give the book a solid 9.5 out of 10 and the pattern by itself 8 out of 10. If you are going to buy it, please remember to go directly to the Etsy page and to buy it directly from them if you can. It really helps people out, especially in these sort of times. With the pattern out of the way, let's talk about my attempts to recreate it as historically accurate as possible. What a pipe dream. I guess I can at least say that I mostly stuck to historical techniques, even if my fabric choices definitely went accurate. But I still did make allowances for my own modern sensibilities. So let's start with the obvious. I had to make some allowances on fabric. Fabric's not as expensive as it was back in the day, not by any means, but silk is still expensive. I think I got overly excited and optimistic about what I could afford, forgetting that I didn't have access to all the little shops that are crammed full of all kinds of exciting things anymore. And that was before the pandemic struck. But it was my first time really shopping around for fabric in a new country and I was struggling between languages and trying to find new suppliers and everything like that. I have never missed Goldhawk Road so much. My plan was to try and stick to silk and linen with cotton velvet for the foundation linings because even I wasn't optimistic enough to think that I could find silk velvet in my budget. If I had managed to find it, I'm pretty sure I would have sworn at it even more than I did on the cotton velvet, but more on that later. With all of that said, as soon as I realised I wasn't going to be using silk, I made the decision that I was going to try very hard to stick to natural fibres, and I did a fairly good job of that, I did as good a job as I could do. Aside from anything else, I didn't want it to get too hot with all of those layers, so natural fibres breathe better and I knew that, which is why I wanted to stick to those in particular. Only the trim and the fashion fabric for the panes have polyester in. With that being said, I really do love the fashion fabric that I chose. It's a really nice pattern, it's really nice to work with, and the shine for a polyester shine is actually really nice. It feels really natural, unlike some polyester shines that are really harsh and not very pleasant, so I was very pleased with that choice. What I did manage to do was to stick to appropriate thread. So I used linen for all of the linings and I used silk for all of the fashion fabrics. It was actually my first time sewing with natural thread and I'm glad that I did it because they were actually really nice to work with. I did use poly cotton for the basting and mostly reused my basting stitches as well, so I was pretty pleased with myself for that. Reducing waste is always good in general, but thinking about small pieces like that felt like a real connection to the past somehow, so that was actually really nice. The other big thing that I struggled with was a couple of finishing techniques. Most of us are used to clothing looking clean and finished. We expect stitching to be as invisible as possible, as well as linings and anything else like that. But historically, this wasn't always the case, and this really shouldn't be a surprise. Dyeing takes time and products, so of course it adds cost to a fabric, and just our ideas of how and what clothes should look like has changed in the last 500 years. Aside from anything else, Clothes these days expect you to have a fashionable figure, whereas clothes up until relatively recently were just made to that figure and you padded and shaped your body to fit inside. All of the structure from the trunk hose are within the garment itself. I promise, this is not my natural shape. But anyway, that led me to doing a couple of extra steps that weren't strictly necessary. Things like understitching the pocket because the white cotton lining was showing through, and not binding the bottom of the legs properly because I didn't have a perfectly matching ribbon. The main difference and the main historically inaccurate technique that I used was how I finished my seams. 
I took the time to pink and then whip every scene down to try and keep it from fraying. Pinking was a thing in Tudor times, but as a decorative thing, and it was done with a heated stamp rather than scissors. A lot of seams, on the other hand, were actually left as they were, completely raw. This is partly because fabric was tighter woven back then, so wouldn't come undone as easily, but also because items were washed in a different way. A lot of the places where I've done historical inaccuracies aren't necessary, but because I'm modern and I think they're necessary, I've still gone ahead and done them. None of these are a problem in particular, and since it's my garment and I'm the one who has to look at it and clean it, I'm glad I did them. But it does mean that I can't claim that all of my techniques were historically accurate. More like historically adequate. Or just modern in some places. I do wish I'd discovered the wax techniques for seams earlier, where wax was used as a sort of medieval fray check, but I'm really excited to do some experimental archaeology with that in the future. The one other thing that I had issues with that's unrelated to historical accuracy was dealing with all of that bloody velvet. I have worked with it a little before, but not as much and not by hand, and I was not expecting it to be as slippy as it is. You may or may not have noticed that I was sewing any place that was velvet to velvet, stitch by stitch. That wasn't because I was trying to be extra accurate, that was because that was the only way I'd found to stop the back piece from going completely awry. I found this out the hard way on the first seam that was velvet to velvet, which was the canyons, and every time I thought I could get away with it later, I quickly found that I couldn't. Of course, there were places like the darts where it was too thick and I needed to do it that way anyway, so it didn't actually slow me down that much, but it definitely wasn't fun. You might have noticed that I don't mention a lot in the videos about pressing, this is because I don't actually have the right tools for pressing velvet. I was pressing it with my iron. This is not the correct way to do it. Because velvet has a nape, which is to say it's got that slightly furry effect to it, it should be pressed with a particular tool which helps to preserve that nape. But I don't have one of those, so I was just pressing it with the iron carefully. This isn't how it should be done, but that is how I did it. So it's another thing that I have to acknowledge as something that I could have done better with it. With all of that said, it sounds like I'm picking these apart, but I'm actually really, really proud of what I've achieved. I started with the trunk hose thinking they'd be easier than the doublet because they're less fitted, and in a way I was right, but having done the mock-up for the doublet since, I think it's actually an easier starting point because it's more familiar by modern standards. Although since the pandemic happened and I got even softer, I am actually glad that I didn't start out with the doublet because I'm not sure I would still fit in it. I've done plenty of hand sewn repairs, a lot of hand embroidery, and when I actually first started cosplay I used to make my cosplays by hand so I wasn't daunted by the challenge. In particular I'm proud of how neat the stitching is on them. I mentioned that the neatest part is the back of the waistband, but I actually can't find the stitches on the trim anymore. That's not just that my stitches are that neat or that tiny, it's also that there's good colour matching and that there was nice easy places to put them on the trim, but even so I'm pretty pleased. And part of the reason that that waistband is so neat is because that was about 600 hours in, it was pretty deep into the costume. So obviously by that point I had all of that experience behind me, and all of that time adds up to really delicate, neat little hand stitches. And I'm proud of that. That is my time that I spent, and it's worth it for the results. All in all, I really love these. I love the shape of them, I love that I got to hand sew them, and I love that it feels like you're wearing some sort of cloud or cushion around your legs. They're pretty heavy, but you actually really don't notice it at least until they're like halfway down your thigh, and that's part of the reason why I'm so excited to get started on the doublet, so that I'll have something to support them so I can wear them properly. I really can't wait to wear the whole outfit together, so that it'll actually stay where it's meant to. Maybe once I have the proper shoes to wear with them as well, I'll just start prancing around town with them. Probably not, aside from anything else, we're still on lockdown but I am really excited to wear them to a con. The one that was meant to be last summer has just been moved forward to next October, and the autumn-winter 
mostly autumn, is a much better time to be wearing all of those layers. So now I'm really looking forward to wearing it to that. I'm not looking forward to getting it on the plane, but maybe I'll wear them and then I can do the historically accurate thing of filling up the lining with all of my belongings and save on some luggage space. That'll definitely be interesting trying to go through security like that, but it will get them through. But all in all, it was a good project. A challenge in places, easy in others, and it was made a lot harder by circumstances of global events. But I'm really glad I took it on, and I'm really, really happy with the results. And that's it. I find it's always helpful to look back on a project with a critical eye, not to berate yourself or make yourself feel bad, but so you can find things that you can improve on next time. It also gives you a chance to look over all the things that you've done right, especially over something that takes so long. A year ago feels like such a long time. There's also something really cool about looking over something that you made and comparing it with that pile of components that you started off with. And always remember that historical sewers weren't perfect either. People can talk about best practice and tiny stitches and perfect fittings, but remember two things. We're not professionals doing this day in and day out. This is our hobby and we can't be expected to have the same amount of experience as someone who does work on this sort of thing so much. And human beings are all about taking shortcuts. We don't have as many records as we do for Tudor times as for, for example, Victorian times, but those records are all written about best practice and don't actually tell us the steps that people took to save time and money. So really, don't be too hard on yourself. My question for you today is, how good are you with instructions? Do you struggle with IKEA instructions or do you find them really easy? What about patterns? My favourite ones are the ones that come with lots of pictures, if you hadn't already guessed that. So I actually really find IKEA ones intuitive and I really enjoy making IKEA furniture. Thank you for watching through to the end, and a huge thank you as always to all of my lovely subscribers and to all of my coffee donators who have been so incredibly generous. Thanks to their help, I've been able to start upgrading my equipment, so if you see an uptick in quality over the next couple of months, you know who to thank. My coffee can be found below if you would like to donate as well. If you enjoyed this or found it helpful, please think about giving me a like and subscribing if you're not already for more sewing and costume related content, or donating to my coffee to help support the channel. Stay safe, stay sensible, and I shall see you around soon. Bye! And the jacquard is 40 polyester and 60%, um, I was going to say balm fall then, which is what it is, but that doesn't help in English. Brain, switch off the German for once, please. I did use col... Collie potton. Collie potton.